Great. Okay, so we've got about 25 minutes. That's great. Oh, lucky for you, I slightly need the loo, so um, we'll get through it quickly. Did I say that out loud? I'm really like, I can't believe it. Can we, can we, rev can you, no, you can't, can you? It's going out live. Hi, everyone. I've got a little prop, but don't worry about the prop too much. So, we have been in a sermon series uh, called Living in the Light of the Resurrection. And uh, we are, um, a couple of weeks ago, Sai uh, spoke about Jesus is alive, and that's really important, obviously, um, in the light of the resurrection. Ellie last week spoke about that we are, are alive in the light of the resurrection. And this morning, I want to focus a little bit about what is it like to have hope, to have confidence in the midst of suffering. You know, the Christian story, Christianity, has something very unique, very extraordinary to say about suffering. And I'm, I'm going to skim across the surface of a, a very profound and deep topic, which is suffering and the place of suffering um, in the Christian story. If you want to go for a deep dive, um, which is not going to happen this morning, but a deep dive, I really recommend Tim Keller's Walking with God Through, through Pain and Suffering and Amy or Luke Ewing's Where is God in All the Suffering? You see, we all come to this word suffering with our own stories, don't we? We all come with, with, a, with a story, with um, a sense of my story, what is the place of my story within this word suffering. And this is kind of holy ground for many of us, isn't it? Because it's often in our suffering where we are the most vulnerable. But at the same time, it's where God can speak and move and work in our lives in very beautiful ways. You know, suffering is everywhere, isn't it? We see it wherever we turn. Um, as Christians, we understand that suffering is a product of our sin, of our brokenness in our broken world, and, and also the evil in our world. And it doesn't take much to look and see brokenness, sin, and evil in our world. And it's very much part of our human condition, isn't it? And it's the one thing, it's the one thing that Jesus himself guarantees for us. Here, I'm going to quote one of the most unpopular promises that Jesus made. He said, in this world, you will have many troubles. Do you know that? You will have many troubles. It's his least popular promise. What do we do when pain, suffering, trial comes to us? What do we do? And if we're honest, sometimes... Sometimes it's often in the suffering that, our, that, that we search for God the hardest. And it can often be in suffering that God is most elusive and hard to find. How do we deal with that? For me, and I've spoken a number of times about this in my own story, everyone comes with a story. My own story is one of physical pain. So I have muscle pain and I have done for 30 years of my life. Every day for 30 years of my life, I have, I have some pain. And uh, that's part of my story. But when the pain is especially difficult for me, I have one of two, two ways to turn. I know it sounds very reductive and simplistic to think of it in these terms, but it's kind of true. I have two paths before me here. I can run from God towards those things that can distract and to make it easier for me and I can bury it and not think about it and all that and all the things that the world offers to us to anesthetize ourselves from pain. Or, so that's one path, or I can run to God. And that choice is really difficult, isn't it, in those moments of suffering and pain. And what happens when, we, when we're in pain and suffering, what can happen is our focus can become very narrow. I don't know whether you've, you've, you've experienced this, where it's very difficult to focus on or think about anything other than the thing that is difficult in our lives. And it becomes more narrow and more narrow until that's all we can think about and it's really difficult to see beyond. And I want us to think this morning a little bit about what does it look like, even when the suffering and the pain and the difficulty which Jesus promises will come to us is that acute, what does it look like? How do we reframe our perspective on suffering? I, um, Sarah and I used to live in Hong Kong, 
and uh, in 2003, and I think in 2004, we were in Chim Sao Choi. Have I said it right? I think I have. Uh, and, uh, and I saw this painting. Well, we saw this painting and we thought, yeah, I love this painting a bit. You know, it's a bit sort of a little avant-garde, you know, a little splash of colour, a bit conceptual, like a bit of modern art. I like the movement of the light coming in from the side. Can you see that? Yeah, can you see it? It's good. Uh, and uh, um, anyway, we hung it up and lots of people, oh, I like your painting. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. It's very, you know. um, and then uh, five years later, a friend of mine, when we were back in London, was looking at it and went, I like that painting, but um, I think if you turn it like this, it's Hong Kong. <laughs> it's, the, it's the skyline of Hong Kong. Can you see the buildings? And I was like, oh, man, <laughs> how idiotic is that? Anyway, we were a little bit embarrassed, but I'm telling you now because I'm over it. I'm over it. And I really like it because it's Hong Kong. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, it's a Hong Kong skyline. Now, why am I telling you this? Um, I, in this passage that uh, Sarah read to us, Peter reframes our perspective on suffering. He reframes it. You know, sometimes we can get so locked into seeing things in a certain way, but it takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the scriptures just to turn it and reframe it so we might be able to see it from a different way and perhaps in the way that the Creator wants us to see it. Okay, so let's look at 1 Peter 1. Now, Peter's writing to the early church. He's writing to a church that is being desperately persecuted by Rome. And he's saying, don't lose heart. There is some theology that you really need to understand if you are to walk through suffering. If you are to get through this pain and suffering, you need to know this. Not just know it up here, but know it in your knower. You know? I don't know what that means, but you know, in, in those deeper places of I know this. And I've highlighted the things that we need to know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them because Ellie and Sai effectively spoke into these things. You know that uh, we are a chosen people. I'm writing to God's chosen people, he says. We, we, God the Father knew me before the beginning of time. Did you know that? He knows you. He knew you for, before the beginning of time. God the Father chose me long ago. That's what Peter is drawing out here. You need to know that. You're known and you're chosen and you're loved. That his Sp Holy Spirit has done a work in you and made you holy set you apart and made you holy. I am forgiven and made clean by the blood of Jesus through the cross and by the work of Jesus on the cross. We are made clean that we can stand before God, righteous and holy. We need to know that if we're to walk through pain and suffering. I am born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. Did you know that? You do. We are born again into new life with Christ. And then finally, you and I, we're going to receive a priceless inheritance kept in heaven for us. If we know that in our knower, if we know that in the very deepest parts of ourselves, then we can draw on that and we can walk through pain, suffering and difficulty that comes our way. And so that's why Peter is able to say here, he's able to say, so be truly glad. Be truly glad because of all this blessing that has come to us. There is a wonderful joy ahead, though many, um, even though you must endure many trials or griefs of many color is the actual translation. Though you may endure griefs of many color for a little while. And so that is my first point. As we come to suffering and try and understand it and reframe it from Peter's perspective and in the light of the resurrection, my first point is this. We reframe it. Our suffering is temporary. It's temporary. Be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Love those four words. For a little while. It's not forever. It's for a little while. When we used to take our boys to the dentist when they were really little and they, one of them had to have a little tooth pulled and it was like really nerve-wracking and horrible. You don't say, yeah, it's going to be 
awful and it'll be it'll last several hours. No, no. It'll be it'll be just a tiny little pain for a, a little while. And then you get a lollipop. And the lollipop in this passage is extraordinary. Um, sorry to reduce it to a lollipop. But the lollipop, what is the lollipop? It is eternal life. It is restoration. It is when Jesus returns, uh, uh, the King of Kings, with the new heaven and a new earth, and we are given a, re a restored body, and we are with God forever. There's your lollipop. It's kind of what Peter's saying. You see, suffering, suffering doesn't win. It doesn't have the final word. This is what Peter's saying. The curse that infected creation in the very first pages of the Bible is once and for all eradicated at the end of the story in Revelation. Yeah. And it says in Re Revelation, love this, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That is the inheritance waiting for us. So bear it, carry it. You can walk through this because it is just for a little while. Framed like that, perhaps we can endure it. Perhaps we can even rejoice in the midst of it. So that's my first point for a little while. It's temporary. The second reframing is our suffering connects us with Jesus. Our suffering connects us with Jesus. And to find this quotation, this is a few chapters ahead in 1 Peter. Peter returns to suffering. Read 1 Peter if you are in a, in a time of suffering in your life. Read 1 Peter because Peter speaks very, very beautifully around this. And he says this, but rejoice insofar as you are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Insofar as you are sharing in Christ's sufferings. We actually, when we suffer, we share in his sufferings, what does that even mean? You know, we have, a, we have a God who bleeds for us. You know, Christianity is so distinct from other faiths, not least because our God bled for us and suffers for us. And in that same way, Christianity has an extraordinarily wonderful thing to say about suffering. And it, it's kind of, it's saying, your suffering has meaning because it connects us with Jesus Christ. I remember being at a, a, a guerrilla Christian event when I was at university. It's a sort of ask Christians anything you want to ask them, hence the sort of grill. Uh, it, it's, I suppose now we would call it Alpha. If it, Alpha's coming up this week, Wednesday night. If, you wanna, if you've got some questions, especially around suffering and God, come to Alpha because that's the perfect place to grill Simon and others. Come on, we all want to do that. You see, Jesus entered into suffering. And I remember being at this little event called Grilla Christian um, when I was um, at university. And the guy spoke eloquently, beautifully. And I remember one person saying, your God has nothing to say about suffering. And his answer was beautiful. He took a poem as part of his answer. And the poem is a lovely poem that I looked up later called Jesus of the Scars. And it says this, the other gods were strong. All the other gods were powerful and mighty and strong. But thou, Lord Jesus, thou wast weak. They rode, but thou did stumble to your throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. We all have wounds. Each and every one of us here are carrying wounds. And the truth of it is that Jesus became wounded for us so that his wounds, only his wounds, speak to our wounds. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. Isn't that a powerful thought? And can you see the intimacy here? Jesus, we are connected to him through our woundedness. We're connected to him 
in our suffering. And that's, it's not something like, do you remember in The Simpsons, Ned Flanders, who sort of said, you know, I'm suffering for Jesus. It's not, it's not that, it's not that. It's in my suffering, it connects me with Christ in a very profound way, perhaps in a way that we won't fully really understand. I think there's great mystery in this. But framed in this way, within this Christian paradigm, suffering can actually have meaning. And it has a redemptive value because if we can share in Christ's sufferings, our suffering actually unites us with Jesus, connects us with him. I mean, how else does, did the early church deal with so much suffering, so much persecution to the degree that they were tortured and they were murdered in brutal ways. How did they do that? They did it because through 1 Peter, they drew on the great comfort and the resource that in suffering, I am closer to Christ and I am in some profound way sharing in his sufferings and therefore drawing resilience, drawing something through and from him. And perhaps even rejoicing right in the midst of it. Some of us here may have done that. You may have been going through a very different, difficult period in your life, but inexplicably, through the Holy Spirit, joy bubbles up from within, and it feels miraculous because your circumstances are absolutely painful. But you can experience that resurrection joy in the midst of suffering. So that's my second point. Suffering actually connects us with him in a, in a profound and deep and, and very beautiful way. And my third and final point is our suffering is repurposed, repurposed. We just sang a song a little bit earlier. Do you remember the lyric? What the enemy meant for evil, you turn it for good. It is repurposed. God didn't bring suffering into my life and your life. I don't believe in that. I'm not a theological determinist. I don't believe that, uh, um, that, 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 that God brings us suffering to teach us things. That's not a God. That is not, a, in my view, that is not a father who loves us. God isn't manufacturing suffering so that he can say, that'll learn you. Now you can be discipled. He's, that is not the God that I understand. Lots of people do believe like that, but I don't. It says in the, in the scripture, it says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. Can you see that? These trials, the things that we're going through, will show that your faith is genuine. Notice that our faith communicates. It is a witness. It testifies to God's goodness in this passage. It's being tested. So what's being tested? Our faith is being tested. And here's the image as fire tests and purifies gold. Here, Peter is saying that the trials and suffering serve to test our faith. When trials come, it tests it. And test not in a, are you going to pass the test? Test as in a refining our faith. It makes our faith pure, like you put heat to gold to burn off all the impurities. That's the image, I think. And as, the heat, as it heats up, the impurities are burnt off. And what is left is the pure gold. And he goes on and says, but, but gold will perish. But your faith, and this is extraordinary, your faith will continue into eternity. And not only that, but it will um, bring much praise and glory and honor in the last days. So in some profound way, our faith, as we meet suffering, God will repurpose it. God will take it and do something beautiful with it. That is not just in our lives now, but it is in our lives now, but also into eternity. Our suffering has meaning. It has meaning. For those of us who've been around long enough, we'll know that the way in which we change as Christians, the way in which God forms us into the image of Jesus for the benefit of others. That's what we call formational discipleship. The primary way God does that, it's, it's not through sermons. It's not through sermons. It's not through the songs we sing. It's not even through um, reading. 
It's not really through gathering, although all these things are really good and important. What's it through? It's through suffering. It's through the valley, it's through the storm, it's through the desert and all the metaphors that the Bible uses to describe it. It's through that that we are refined, that our faith is tested and refined and made pure. And in that way, we become more like Jesus. It's reframed. I remember asking somebody, and I'm going to finish very soon. I remember asking someone who had been through some very terrible things in their lives, very difficult things. Um, and I asked them, if you could go back, would you go through them all over again? And they thought for a, a long moment. Um, and, uh, and then they said this, without that time in my life, I wouldn't be the person I am today. So I guess I would. Wow. I don't know whether you're there. It reminds me of Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he's left, when he let out of prison, and uh, his his faith was refined in an extraordinary way. And he turned back, and I'm going to misquote him, but he said, "Thank you, prison. <sighs> Thank you." So, I've scratched the surface of this topic. Our suffering is temporary, folks. Peter says it's temporary, but reframe it through the resurrection. And we understand that it's temporary and it's unto something wonderful and glorious. Our suffering connects us with Jesus and our suffering is repurposed for his glory in ways that we won't really fully understand now, this side of glory. I'd like to end with this thought before we're, band is going to come up. And actually, band, why don't you come up now? And um, you might want to start playing. It may sound, and I was worried about this when I wrote this, it may sound that I'm, I'm trying to put a positive spin on suffering, and I'm really, really not. Um, you might think it's sort of a, hey, just look at it in a different, if you reframe it, look at it in a different way, then it'll be easier and you'll be able to bear it. I'm not saying that at all. Some suffering, uh, suffering is horrible. Suffering is difficult. We need to acknowledge it. We need to recognize how painful it can be. When we are grieving for someone we love, that is painful. And however much reframing we do, we still need to feel and experience the pain of grief and loss. Do you hear me? I'm not trying to sentimentalize suffering. I don't think you can. There's nothing noble about suffering. It's horrible. And sometimes pain just really hurts and we just need to get through it. Sometimes grief is really, really difficult and we just need to get through it. But I love what Eugene Peterson says. He says this, a Christian is a person who decides to face and live through suffering. A Christian is a person who decides to face, we face it, and we are living through it. And how do we do that? How do we face this week when we have a funeral coming up of Bella? Because we live and we face it and we can go through it with Jesus. That is the answer. Jesus makes suffering sufferable for us. He does because he transforms it. He's with us in it and he renews us through it. He dealt with suffering by suffering. He made a way through suffering with suffering and he made an end, he brought an end to suffering by suffering. And so what do we do? We bring our pain, we bring our difficulty, we bring our grief, we bring our anger to God. I started with that question. Do we take him to God or from God? We take it to him. Did you know that the Bible, the third of the Bible of certainly the Old Testament is made up of lament, is made up of poetry, lamentations and psalms, which is David expressing his anger and fury and asking the unanswerable questions and saying, why God? And in doing that, he's praying his suffering. That's where we bring our pain. We bring our pain to Jesus. Amen.